So let's just, I'm going to go ahead and open up Terra. We don't have to stay there long. I just, just want to touch on what we expect the data to be in um, when it gets into LP360. So technically, you could pick any output coordinate system you wanted to. It's not a problem, but uh, the way we handle imagery in LP360 right now, um, if you want to do an ortho photo, if you want your image, image explorer to be accurate, you know, with the with the imagery that's coming out of the L1 camera, you know, along with the L1 uh, laser data, um, you have to export the data in meters, so metric. And for the vertical component, you have to select default, which is going to be ellipsoidal meters. So let me, I'm just going to go real quick and just show you what that would look like. So a lot of times your clients and, and our clients, um, they're wanting to pick, you know, a state plane coordinate system. We'd recommend if at all possible. So if they don't care about the imagery from the L1, they're flying a P1 or a Phantom 4 RTK or, you know, they don't even care about the imagery at all. This is not as important. You know, you can be a little bit um, less selective with the coordinate system you pick. I believe it even handles feet just fine. So you could do, you know, uh, Colorado state plane, U.S. survey feet, and then do nav D88, uh, geoid 18, you know, orthometric heights and feet. I think you'd be fine. But the reason that we don't do that and the reason that when I teach this normally, we don't do it in that coordinate system is because it will break the imagery at that point as far as importing LP360 and then generating an ortho with that imagery in LP360. So that's why we don't do it. Um, so in this kind of, if I wanted to keep the linkage with the, with the imagery, then I would do something like, this is 93, 2011, Alabama East. We prefer 93, 2011 and LP360 just in general, just FYI. And notice that there's no unit distinction here. So I'm, I'm basically just, this is going to be in meters. So I got my horizontal set. This is in meters and I just leave this default. And that, that's basically it guys. Um, uh, you know, you want your state plane coordinate system or whatever your projected coordinate system to be in meters. And if you leave this default, it's going to be ellipsoidal meters for the vertical. And it's just as simple as that. So at this point, you would hit start processing and it would generate your, your point cloud and all that stuff for you, which I've already done. So I'm starting up LP360. All right, you're going to go to the import TrueView micro drones or guest sensor when you open it up. Or if you ha happen to hit cancel or somehow you got out of this dialogue, just remember that the import button, I believe it's accessible through, uh, actually, I don't think it's accessible through file. You'd have to go to this button right here on the left, which is the same as the import dialogue at the beginning that you just saw. So you just select uh, import, you know, new true view data set or guest sensor. You'll click on this button here down at the bottom and then you'll choose the L1. Then just you'll just hit next. You'll need to select the raw folder. Just do it one at a time if you've got multiple flights. And now you can, oh, I want to make one other distinction with you guys. I think I went a little too fast through Terra. There's one other uh, point to make here. You need to process each flight individually in Terra. Do not combine a whole bunch of flights in Terra and output one big uh, LAS file. Okay, it's it's critical, um, and the reason is is because we do the organization LP360 by flight and flight line. So um, not only is strip align kind of helping with the you know flight line to flight line mismatch, but also flight to flight mismatch too. I mean it's it's kind of a double whammy. Uh, I mean it's really just flight line to flight line, but uh, for organization purposes and for LP360 processing purposes, we always process data on a flight by flight basis. Okay, so I, I went ahead and added that one flight, and I'm going to go ahead and add another. Okay, so just add all the flights that you need to process. Notice, like right off the bat, I'm getting some some validation errors. It can't find the SBIT folder. It can't find the LAS folder. Now, if this is the the same exact computer that you did the Terra processing on, look look where it's trying to look for those folders. It should be, it really shouldn't be looking in that spot. Okay, here we go. It should be looking where it looks for these files, just for your knowledge, is C drive, documents, where basically wherever you've set up um, you know, the default location for your DJI products uh, to go into is the C drive, documents, 
DJI, DJI Terra. I mean, it's looking it's looking for the the SBET data here. So if you happen to give the raw data to somebody else, um, you need to give them the process data too, and then they'll have to point to it as well, which is what I'm going to have to do. So, but if you're on the same computer that you did your Terra processing in, when you bring in that raw file, more than likely it's going to automatically point to the proper spot. All right. So if you if you need if you haven't done the processing on on this machine, you're sharing the data. What you'll have to do is double click. Let's just go to try on a one DJI processing lidars. There's the files we're looking for. So the SBED out the search trajectory file, and then it's based because I kept all the relative um, you know pathing the same in the project like it's expecting. It's able to find the LAS folder as well automatically and the report folder it's looking for those three files basically from your terror processing okay uh let me double click on this guy and go ahead and set this one but this i'm basically showing how you would do it if you were sharing the data with somebody and they had the data in a different spot so you should be some, seeing something like this at this point we do have some additional things we can do if we want. We can name the area. So I'm just going to go ahead and do that. It's the same area for this one. And we can add ancillary files if we want. So think um, checkpoint files, uh, project description, PDF, maybe, maybe um, a KML file um, of the area. Um, just whatever files, maybe some pictures of the checkpoints on the ground or or the features on the ground that you're going to be mapping. I mean, just something, uh, any any information, supplementary information that was going to be useful to the project that you want to keep. Um, I get my guys to leave their pilot logs in the ancillary files. All right, I'm going to hit next. Now, you can have a project's root folder set. Uh, beforehand, so every time you're doing processing, it's always putting it in the same folder. You'll go ahead and select a project's root folder. Again, in a little bit, I'll show you how to set the default setting for that, which you might already know, uh, but we'll review it anyways. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put it in here. This will be my project area, and then I'll give it a project name. So this is, um, we'll call this uh, trying to. For this, okay. you're just going to pick exactly the same. Uh, coordinate system that we used uh, in Terra. We go ahead and click next. I'll go ahead and uh, uh, click finish. Click yes. So go ahead and click next or yes. Okay, so the next step is if you go to view, yeah, it's right here. So I'll um, see if I can pull it out. It's this guy. So the next thing you'll do is click on this guy. So you'll notice if you're used to doing TrueView processing, usually the first button that's lit up is the post-processing button. Um, it's already been processed. So um, a lot of times people, when they fly the L1, they're flying with RTK. So it's already, I mean, you're already done. The data is already, um, has, it's already been corrected, you know, at the time of the flight. So um, at this point right now, we just go ahead and cut flight lines. So for strip align to work and to work properly, we've got to cut up the flight into to separate flight lines, and then it can do its magic as far as the dynamic heading error correction and then the, the GNS, potential GNSS offsets that are occurring during the flights. And if you look here, um, we've got all of our flights listed. So you'll do this one flight at a time. So, um, so go ahead and click on this button. This is just um, you're restricting the length that's allowed to create a flight line for. So if I make this bigger than the legs, you know, the legs of the flight, it won't include those as being a flight line and then turn radius, you know, so we don't want to include the turns. Um, yeah, a lot of times the data is kind of gets sprayed on the turns. So you want to cut those out and then max deviation. So um, sometimes when it's really windy, you'll see this flight kind of get a little bit dicey, you know, get a little bit curvy. So you may have to bump up that max deviation value a little bit to include it, that's all. So let's just go ahead and try these settings to begin with. 
then you can go in and um, you've got, so we've picked up some of these that we don't care about down here. Want to get rid of those. Um, these uh, flight lines to and from the takeoff location, uh, we don't want to include those. So what we can do, click on your, um, click on this green arrow in the feature edit toolbar. It's this guy, let me turn it on and off. I'll go and pull it out just so you can see it. It's the feature edit toolbar. Click on the green arrow because we're gonna we're gonna select some features. I'm just gonna select the flight lines that I don't want. Um, if you click to the right of the green arrow, you can select different ways to do your left click and drag operation to select these features. I like the lasso myself, so left click and hold. But I'll just demonstrate the other ones to you. So this one makes a box. This one you um, click a polygon out. Um, but I really like the lasso personally. And if you do a control left click when you're doing the lasso, just hold down control, you can do a multi select. So you can really play with it. So I already know that there's some stuff down here I don't want. All right. Uh, you can either hit the delete key or this red X up here in the, the feature edit toolbar. It's just going to ask you if you confirm if you want to delete those and say yes. And there we go. Nice and clean. So if you like what you see, then you can hit the, the blue save button up here. If you don't like it and you're like, crap, I didn't I didn't mean to do that. And I just I kind of want to go back and then play with it some more. You can hit the undo button up here. And then we have a redo button as well. So I'm going to hit save because I like it. And let's just say you didn't want to make any edits at all. You can just hit the trash can button. So now we want to do the create trajectory step. We already have a trajectory, but we're going to we're going to create our split up trajectory. So let's go ahead and click on that guy. Here. So whenever you process a Metashape, we just tell Metashape to auto calibrate. I'm just going to retain the photos and the flight lines. Um, I'm going to up, choose to update the EXIF data, but we also select the target EPIC as well here. Um, this is the default EPIC for 93 2011, unless you really need to change that um, for a specific reason, I would not touch it. For starting flight line, this goes for TrueView. This goes for any LiDAR project where you're making flight lines and creating them. Do never, never start with just one here unless you're just doing a single flight. If you're doing a single flight, that's all the project is. You don't have to touch this. It doesn't matter. But if you're processing multiple flights, if you start with one every time, you're going to have multiple flight lines, you know, between flights that share the same point source ID. And it can get really confusing, especially if you have to troubleshoot something went wrong. Um, so if you are processing multiple flights, I would start off with either 100 or 101 or 1001. It's up to you. Um, a lot of times customers will use 101. That way 101 is the first flight line for a flight. 102 is the second flight line and so on. Um, so and then for our next flight, we'll pick either 200 or 2000. We'll just we're just trying to stay organized with. So uh, we'll just start with 101 just for this example. So at this point, we're ready to geocode. So let's just go ahead and do that. You can uh, clip range and you can, uh, or clip angle and you can clip range. Um, this, this is the distance from the sensor that's going to be clipping back towards the sensor. And this is max. So anything beyond 300 meters away from the sensor is going to clip out. I'm just going to just do clip angle and just see how this turns out. So um, we've got the LAS data geocoded for our first flight, and now you'll just you'll just go through the line. So um, I've already done this for the first flight. You can see the LAS data the way it's named. It's named in accordance with the flight that was flown as well, and you see that here in the active LAS layer. Okay, so let's, we're going to go to the next one, and I'm just going to breeze through this. So compute flight lines. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and remove those uh, flight lines to and from the takeoff location. Here, I'm going to hit the, hit the delete key this time. Same same result. And then if you like what you did, just remember to hit the blue floppy disk icon. And now I'm just going to go straight to the next step. 
Um, so this is the second flight. So now I, I know to start with flight line number two. So, so I'll start with 201. Hit OK. And then again, you'll do the geocode step. Let's go ahead and display. We can display a bunch of different ways, but um, one of them is point source ID. See how the colorization, I'll tint it just so you can see it a little bit better. See how the colorization is, is on a flight line to flight line basis. And that's the whole reason we go to the trouble of doing unique names for those. And you can see we've got tons of overlap. So um, this, this looks good. So at this point, you should, should have like your raw geocoded data now. Notice that this option here um, basically uh, allows only one LAS layer to be viewed at a time. Of course, you can have as many LAS files as you want in a layer, and you can view that layer at the same time. But we've separated these LAS files out. Each layer represents a flight at this moment, at this moment in time. So we want to run Stripalon. This this guy up here. Now, of course, license level wise file license manager. I've got my my um, all my experimental stuff that you guys probably don't see. Uh, a lot of L1 customers are getting um, LP360 just so they can use triple on. So um, a lot of times they'll have that. And then you'll have an additional, you're the, it could be named fast photo or photo 3000 or full photo. It can be called different things, but they may have an additional uh, photo license for doing their um, uh, build no ortho mosaics and things like that. But I just have a bunch of things checked out right now. So um, so now, because I have the, the Stripalon uh, add-on license checked out, I'm going to go and click on that guy. You should see something like this. Um, let me go ahead and um, what's going to happen is you're going to click use for all of the flights that you want to basically Stripalon together. In an ideal world, you bring in all the flights together at import. You know, you do the the geocoding, you know, in a line, basically like, like I've done here with two flights, uh, and then uh, you strip align those at the same time together. So, and you're going to create. Uh, I I, rec I highly recommend that you create a new layer with this and and not append to the existing LAS layers. I think that's a really bad idea. So I'm going to go ahead and submit the triple on job. Once it kicks off the triple on job, it'll send you an email basically saying that it's been kicked off. So what we do is for this, for ortho mosaic jobs that take a long time, we send you that notification email, kicks off, it's processing, and you get a basically a notification email when it's stopped. OK, so I'm just going to zoom in on this this, this roof area again. Uh, that, I think that looks much better. Let's see. I mean, there's still some thickness to it, but that's expected with the L1. Let's just compare this to some of the other flights. So, so this is our original one of our original LAS uh, layers. So I'll go back to Stripalon and see how much better that looks. It's the original. There's your Stripalon. So it makes a big difference. It really does. OK, the next step, um, we'll go to point cloud task. You guys may already have some smoothing uh, point cloud tasks that were provided to you. You've already created before, but I'm going to make one from scratch. So I clicked on the point cloud task tab here at the bottom. Uh, click on the gear con icon here at the top right. Um, and then I'm just going to add a new point cloud task. And then I'm going to call it. Um, Oh, I mean, I got to pick the right one here. Um, it's a smoothing point cloud. And I'm just going to call it smoothing test. You can name it whatever you want. Um, by default, when I made that new one, you can see it's it's kind of hard to tell, but this is actually highlighted. It's actually been highlighted automatically whenever you created it. So if you if you create a brand new point cloud task and just hit OK right afterwards, it's just going to load it right up. Look what happens when I uh, you can filter by different things. This I could 
uh, you can filter by type. I'll just show you. So you can see, um, I, I'd already made one previously that I'm using on everything, but you can have as many point cloud tasks as you want, you know, that have specific settings. You could name it like um, railroad project, you know, uh, February, and it could be a lot of settings specific to that data set, you know, and you could group them up. So there's a lot of flexibility on how you set these up. Output structure. I would say in general, never create a single file. I, I, I almost wish this option wasn't available. You should tile the data. So right now, as the data stands, I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit. I'm gonna show by point source ID. Um, watch what happens, so I'm sorting by point source ID. Now I'm gonna sort by file. Should basically look the same. Each each file, each LAS file it corresponds with the individual flight line. When we run smoothing, it's going to make a whole bunch of basically optimize the amount of LAS files we have um, based on uh, performance parameters, not on uh, whether they correspond to any, uh, individual flight lines. But it's fine that we have the tile data like that because we've got that point source ID, that unique point source ID flag, so we can still keep track of our ind individual flight lines if we want to after the fact. So. Just wanted to mention that. Um, so tile files, and then you want to output all points. Um, I see a lot of times where people uh, select to output only smooth points. Just think if it's, especially with this L1 data set, the data is noisy. If, if, if we fail to smooth it, um, it's unlikely that you want to throw away that data, right? I mean, if it's um, uh, vegetation, um, uh, maybe some features that um, just for whatever reason our algorithm couldn't handle it and it couldn't smooth them, um, you still probably want to include those. So um, I usually say uh, output all points. This is what I select. So what we're doing now is we're going to make a whole new folder and a whole new LAS layer with a bunch of um, basically a bunch of LAS files associated with that LAS layer that's going to be in the folder that we set here. So um, you can browse to an individual folder. I don't recommend that you do that. I think that's a bad idea, um, especially if you're trying to say organize project to project. We have another function called uh, the concept of project path setting for the output. So if you click in here, click on um, the option here in the top right, the greater than, less than symbol. It's going to put that in here. And mm -hmm. now I can make any kind of folder structure I want. So I'll maybe I'll do outputs. I'm just making this up. You can come up with your own organization method. Um, LAS smoothed. LAS. Or even I could even do just LAS smoothed. Something like that. And watch what happens when I hit enter. That green check turns to this little yellow icon. All that's telling me is, is if you hover over it, this folder doesn't exist yet. I don't care. I want to make, I want, I'm creating that folder structure. So I'm happy with that, but it's no longer a red X basically saying I don't have an output setting. I also have it uh, set to add to map. So um, uh, it'll automatically add that to the map and to my table of contents. If I have that unchecked, it's going to run and place the files there, but it won't add it to the table of contents and it will not add it to the map. So I'll have that checked. So what's nice is you set this one time, you know, this is going to ask you to hit apply uh, to, to save the settings. So now, you know, I run this in different projects. It's going to be placing the data relative to that project. Um, whereas if I picked a specific location, if I accidentally run this in a new project, you might overwrite data on accident or something like that. So this project path variable can be used but, um, in a variety of different circumstances and a variety of different uh, point cloud tasks. So it's a pretty powerful uh, option. I just wanted to review that with you. If you have any questions, let me know. So um, for source filter, I haven't I haven't touched that um, because I want to I, I want to basically do the smoothing on all points. But you could play with that filter if you wanted to. There's some other things you could do here, but make sure running this in the active LAS layer. So if you're playing around with the LAS layers, you want to make sure that you're running this on the Strip align layer, not one of your other original LAS layers. Now we're going to run by project. And then I'm going to click yes, and then it's going to, we're off to the races. It's going to take some time. 
Uh, okay, so mine finished. So one thing you'll likely want to do um, is come as in as last layer one, probably for you too. So I'm going to change yep. that and as the definition to smoothed. Okay, um, I can bring it down. So I can. This is just like ArcGIS. So this is a sandwich. We're looking down at the top of the sandwich, and then on, on down we go. So um, I put this smooth basically in line with my other last data and then below my features so I can still see them on top of the last data. I'll switch to smooth here. Let's just quick draw a quick profile over that same building. Yep. It should be looking pretty clean now. I think. Let's see how we're looking. Let's compare. So there's our smoothed, there's our strip aligned, and here's our original. So we've come a long way. So it really does help out your L1 data sets. So, okay, let's say you've done, at this point you could proceed with classification, that's fine. Uh, let's say you've either done classification or you want to go ahead and reproject and continue processing the reprojected data set. Okay, um, so ideally, before you create the DEM, uh, you will have done ground classification and then make a DEM based on that ground classification. I'll just review making a DEM with the, the raw data. So this is the smooth data set. So I went to the uh, export data button here at the top. I'm going to collect uh, select surface. Export format, GeoTIFF, that's what Metashape likes. And then you could do auto compute cell size to get the best quality. A lot of times, what I'll do is something around like uh, 15, 20, 30 centimeters. So, just for this example, just to speed things up, maybe I'll just do a, a one meter cell size. That's probably mm -hmm. too big for the average person, but normally you would do something like, you know, 0.15 or you can always do auto compute cell size if you if you want the best fidelity DEM. So I'm just going to do one meter just to speed things up for this presentation because I'm not actually going to kick off the MetaShape process. I'm just going to go over settings. I'm just going to export basic extent, but you could cookie cut by polygon if you just want an ortho for for a, a subset. You know, maybe it's possible towards the edges the uh, um, Ortho is not going to look so great anyways, so you might want to create a, a boundary using the feature edit tools, and you could uh, specify that here with the cookie cut polygons uh, option. And I'll select uh, export file. So it's going to look something like this. And then when you go to your ortho mapping, You'll select all the retained photos from all the flights. It's automatically going to pick that uh, whatever TIFF file I think is at the top of this. So make sure you're selecting the correct file if you loaded something else from another project or something. Um, and uh, you'll select the ortho name. Go to advanced settings. It's really important that you do this for the L1 advanced settings. Uh, pick update calibration. We don't have a calibration for the L1 sensor. So if you use fixed calibration, your results are going to be pretty terrible. So go ahead and click uh, in the advanced settings to update calibration when you run this, okay, for the L1. Now for the TrueView system, we've spent the time to do a camera calibration for the the, the, the sensors on the TrueView units. So you want to use the default setting of use sensor fixed calibration. So just keep that in mind. All these other default settings should be okay. You, you would submit your ortho mapping job and Hopefully, if everything went well, then um, your your ortho is going to turn out pretty good, and you can compare that against your point cloud data. Just be aware that um, um, you know we don't have a, a camera calibration for the L1 sensor, so it's just not going to. It may not be quite as tight with the the laser data as some of our TrueView systems, or like a like a Phantom 4 RTK. We've got a really good camera lab calibration with the camera on that that sensor that we do for, for clients. So um, those results are always going to look better out of Metashape than, than something with uh, letting it. But it meant Metashape does a pretty good job if you don't have a camera calibration of, of lining things up. So um, 
you can play with the the settings to see if your results improve but um that's what i would recommend basically what i've reviewed is just basically the nuances with the l1 system doing to review processing and and what you need to do to to make everything work